but in some states you need a, an attorney to uh, handle the documents purchasing a house. In other states you just need an assessor or a title, uh, title processor who isn't uh, a lawyer but does exactly the same work, handles exactly the same documents. Right? You think, think of the medical profession. Right, the rise of so-called nurse practitioners who are not MDs and have not paced, passed the state medical licensing exam, but yet do a lot of the same services that doctors perform. Okay, a lot of routine medical care. So imagine that even without bar exams and this kind of official certification, some people could specialize in performing legal services. And there would be a demand for their services and there would be a supply of people available to perform those services. Right. Then some clever lawyers get together and say, hey, you know, we shouldn't allow just anybody to be a lawyer. I mean, that would not be in the public interest. Right? Then you could have all kinds of people out there offering legal services who aren't properly trained and they're misleading the, the uninformed consumer. We need to have restrictions on who can be a lawyer. We need to make everybody go to law school and have a degree. We need to make everybody pass a really hard exam and everybody to get a license from the state, from the government that says you are hereby qualified to practice law. Okay, so imagine that all these restrictions are put in place. For example, make everybody take the bar exam. Well, the available stock of attorney services in a world where you have to pass the bar exam and go to law school and so on to be a lawyer is less than the stock of people who could perform legal services in the absence of, of the licensing restriction. Okay? So the effect of having restrictions, like restrictions on entry is obviously to raise wages. Right? So the equilibrium price of legal services in a world with all these restrictions is higher than it otherwise would. Right now if you talk to attorneys, they will not say, well of course we must have these strict licensing requirements so we can make more money. They'll say, oh my goodness, we have to protect the public from unscrupulous attorneys. You know, I mean, there's a lot that can be said about that argument and, and how fallacious it is, right? Well, I mean, it obviously assumes that people are, it's very extremely patronizing, assumes that consumers would not be able to tell who's performing decent services or not. They couldn't rely on third party, independent certifiers, and so on. But, I mean, I always think, well, it, it, if, if protecting the public welfare is the rationale for occupational licensing for lawyers or doctors, you know, what explains requirements for occupational licensing for barbers? Why do you have to pass a test and get a government certificate to be able to cut hair? You know, is it to protect the public from the menace of bad hair? Uh, it's really hard to come up with a sort of a public interest rationale for those kinds of restrictions. Okay, um, let me tell you a little bit, let's talk a little bit more about some of the details or peculiarities of compensation. Um, the first thing to realize is that, right, employers, uh, employers bid for labor services according to the discounted marginal revenue product of units of, of labor. Right, but how the units of labor are paid can be quite complex. In other words, I may generate, say, $100 an hour worth of labor services for my employer in terms of discounted marginal revenue product, but I don't have to get that $100 in cash. Right? I could receive, I could receive it in all cash. I could receive some of it now and uh, some of it in deferred compensation. I could receive some of it in cash and some of it in services like fringe benefits, health insurance, medical care, uh, retirement planning, and so on. Uh, I could receive some of it in terms of um, enjoyment or satisfaction. In other words, my employer might say, look, you, know, uh, you can get $100 an hour and work in, a, you know, in, in, a, in an unattractive cubicle, or you can get $75 an hour and work in this luxurious office. And some workers would be happy to receive part of their compensation in terms of a pleasant work environment. Whereas there's nothing in our theory that says that wages have to be paid purely in cash up front. Okay? Um, it turns out that uh, the, the, empirically uh, the, the ratio of salary or 
cash compensation to fringe benefits is not the one that would presumably emerge in a, in a free market for labor. Right? A lot of it is affected by tax policy. So the fact that wages are taxed, but the cash value of fringe benefits is untaxed, right, means that many of us prefer to receive some of our compensation in terms of insur health insurance and retirement uh, or contributions to our retirement accounts and so on, because uh, that lowers our overall tax burden. Right? So there's a distortion in how labor market, one example of a labor market distortion, uh, effective tax policy on um, the ratio between salaries and benefits. Um, interesting point on uh, minimum wages is some economists have observed that there are cases in which minimum wages have been increased or established where they weren't established before. And if you remember in the diagram that we had yesterday, in fact, we saw it twice. Joe had one version, I had one version, right, where the government sets a legal minimum wage that is uh, above the market clearing or equilibrium wage, right, that leads to an excess supply of labor. The quantity of labor supplied exceeds the quantity of labor demanded. There's a surplus of labor or unemployment and a reduction in the quantity of labor that is employed. Okay, fewer laborers, there are fewer labor transactions than there would be in the absence of the minimum wage. However, some people have observed, as I said, there are particular markets where minimum wages have been imposed or increased, and the quantity of labor employed does not seem to go down. Or it doesn't go down as much as our analysis would predict. How can we explain that? Does that mean there's not a downward sloping demand for labor? Well, one explanation in some markets is that even in low-wage industries, fast food, for example, uh, workers receive some of their compensation in non-monetary benefits, such as uh, break times, uh, discounted meals, uh, whether uh, having an employer-supplied uniform, and so on. Right, so what, what some firms have done in fast food, for example, is responded to an increase in the government's minimum wage, not by laying off workers, but by reducing their actual wage rates while continuing to pay the legally mandated minimum wage by giving the workers shorter breaks, making them buy their own uniforms instead of providing the uniforms for them, uh, um, making them buy meals instead of giving them reduced price meals or free meals. Right? And in cases in industries where there are additional fringe benefits like health insurance and so on, uh, re re reducing the amount of coverage of those, the provision of those fringe benefits. So that the, the, the real value of the wage has gone down even though the amount of cash you're paying per hour stays the same or goes up. Right? So employers have ways of adjusting the actual compensation in a way to try to get around artificial restrictions on m money wages. Okay? Um, something else that we observe in some labor markets is that employees often have a long-term relationship with particular employers. Right? It isn't the case that every labor market transaction is kind of a spot market transaction where you hire a unit of labor for an hour or for a day and then at the end of the trading period the employer and employee go their separate ways and never see each other again. Okay. I mean, most of us are employed in long-term relationships with particular employers, right? And so the amount of pay may vary considerably over the period of this relationship, right? And what our theory explains is that the, 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 the total amount of compensation received over this period will reflect the total value of the discounted marginal revenue product over this period. But they may not be equal on a day-to-day -day basis, right? In other words, there are some occupations where individual employees, new employees who are just starting out, may actually be paid less than their discounted marginal revenue product. And more senior or tenured employees are paid more than their discounted marginal revenue product. And firms may use this as an incentive device. Right, as a means of trying to encourage younger workers to invest in firm-specific training and so on, and to do the things that are necessary to get promoted to, be, to become more senior workers at some point. Right, so this doesn't indicate a...